Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of jazzy drumming, but not in jazz, exploring, I guess, predominantly rock and metal with some drumming that's a little not rock and metal style. Today we're going to be checking out some Opeth, and if there's a band that I would expect to have some jazzier drumming in it, Opeth is certainly one of them. We're going to be looking at the song Nepenthe from their Heritage album. Let's see what Opeth is bringing to the table today. Yeah, this is a very quiet opening. I mean, we're consistently sitting about 40 decibels under max. I mean, you can see the volume over there. We're not even really at half volume. Well, we just begun to sit around half here half to 75 percent very chill calm atmosphere we have the light drumming in the background beautiful reverb on the guitar Oh, dang, I knew that was funky, but this bass came in and just punched it up a notch. The interest... <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, jeez. I was going to say that the interesting contrast between the funky guitar work and then the uh, droning guitar work that we had over here, yeah, that feels very primus, but then they just got playful going back to the quiet section, back to this, this is definitely primus.
little bit of a triple poly rhythm there on the snare. I like themes where we get odd choices like this. Like, I don't think this is a really great song for reaction. There's some interesting stuff here, but it does fit the theme. And I don't know that we would have ever checked it out otherwise. The random panning to the right. It certainly feels more like a an album track making more sense in the larger work of art than as something that works well on its own. Yeah, that's a bizarre little song, even for Opeth, who tends to write some some out there stuff at times. But I can get behind this. It's basically two modes to this. There's the light and chill and the funky and groovy, and that's kind of it. We just kind of we bounce back and forth the, between those two. So we'll talk about both of those in isolation, and maybe I'll come to some idea of what they represent together. But I think there's going to be a shorter reaction right here. Um, so yeah, the lighter side of things. This comes in, starts off with very light drum work, very light guitar chords, beautiful little... Um, reverb on the guitar the tone itself is just gorgeous and eventually these chords turn into these longer phrases still just you know six to seven notes some reverb allowing that last note to ring out and then a few bar a few bars a few beats of silence before the next phrase comes in interestingly i will say that this is kind of jazzy it has that bluesy element to it that even blues rock ended up uh, utilizing for a while in its guitar melody writing is having this spaciousness to the phrasing. Um, and I enjoy that. It's just, it's a beautiful tone, beautiful melodies, and I love the pacing of it, the, the breathiness of it, taking these moments to just allow a note to exist and for whatever feeling those last, you know, five to ten notes might have put in the listener for it to just sit there and the listener to feel it for a while before moving on. It's beautiful. The bass tone in here is great as well. Sitting on the bottom here, just really filling out this low end. Not really doing like pedal tone or anything like that, but providing these small, short little melodies. Two to four notes each. Just little little bits of movement to help the song feel like it's actually progressing somewhere. A majority of this part, though, I think is driven by the drums, which... This is of a week focused on the drums. Let's talk about them for a little bit. Is this jazzy drumming? I don't know. I My gut says no. It's one of those, when it comes to jazzy styles of drumming, I can certainly quantify what makes drumming jazzy, but there's some times that I've heard stuff outside of that specific rigidity and be like, yeah, you know, I'd still call that jazz. It's one of those things that you just kind of have to suss out. You, you, you know it when you hear it. And I think here, here's the thing about jazzy drumming. I feel like I brought this up every day this week, but I also am going to assume that some people are going to find this reaction for Opeth and not because they're fans of the channel and have kept up with every day this week. Uh, but jazzy drumming is primarily based around putting your accents on your cymbals, primarily utilizing your cymbals, and sparsely utilizing your snare, toms, and bass. Even, I mean, the bass kick, really, just don't use it too often. <laughs> really, not a lot. It's, it's a big opposite of rock and metal, which tends to utilize the cymbals for rigidity's sake. They're the metronome. You know, ride cymbal quarter notes on your downbeats or every other note or something like that to keep the rhythm while your accent pattern, your groove is going to come from your bass kick and snare. Basically just completely invert it to get jazz. Um, here though, a majority of the cymbal work is the hi-hat pedal. It's the two cymbals coming together. Tss, 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 tss. 
giving us a quarter note groove. We really get very minimal drumstick on cymbal work in this. The snare gets utilized a ton. Now granted a lot of it is ghost notes, but we do get the accents on the snare too. What I will say though is that there is something jazzy about the way that we have the syncopation between the differences between the ghosts and the accents. And I, I uh, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning of this week, I'm not going to be too mad if we don't get pure jazz drumming this week because it's such a strange ask for this very specific type of music in anything else. Um, so, you know, I'm not like, oh, this shouldn't have been here this week. I think it's a fine addition to the week. And I can see how somebody would have listened to this and said, yeah, that's kind of jazzy, especially if they're not familiar with jazz drumming. Uh, but uh, on the other side of the coin, I don't think you would ever hear the drumming like this in a majority of jazz music. That's not to say it doesn't exist and there is a rock style of jazz that this might have been present in or that you might be able to find something similar in. Um, but yeah, there's just nowhere near enough cymbal work. But I guess the theme is called jazzy drumming and this is jazz adjacent. It's definitely not very rockish. So I don't know. It works. Uh, I do like what it brings to the table, though. The ghost notes throughout the quieter sections absolutely sells them. Uh, it sells the the intimate and vulnerable elements of that writing while still providing this direction, this movement. It doesn't allow those sections to feel stagnant because the drummer is always pushing somewhere. And I think it's a great way to build these sections while allowing them to retain the atmosphere that they do. There's also a bluesier side to the melody in uh, the A section that we'll call it, but it's it's like a bright positive bluesiness. I don't know how to describe that. It always feels like the first three notes out of the guitar melody. I was like, oh, okay, blues, and then it pushes into something very bright and beautiful. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, maybe it's not blues. <laughs> and I had that back and forth so often on this track. <laughs> That I, I don't really know what to call the uh, the key, the melody writing. So, I don't know. But this always gave way for funk. And this is strange too because it, it's, it's the tonal opposite, right? <laughs> we go from light and introspective, quiet, moody, tons of space to filling the space, more volume, more layers, more sound, more energy, more direction. We have we have hard syncopation and groove in here. We have two guitars instead of one. One of them gives us the funky groove, the repeated lick. The other one is like sound. <laughs> it's a lot of droning and, and texture work on it. And I'll tell you, man, I, I said it during the reaction, feels very primus. Uh, this section in isolation pairing a groovy riff with noise making which is often what we hear from the bass and the guitar in primus work but even just the fun element of smashing these two sounds together the a and the b section here is also something i think we would see with primus so i'm, I'm honestly curious if opeth had primus uh, inspirations here because you know if it wasn't for Akerfelt doing the, the vocals and you just gave this to me and asked me, hey, what band is this? Uh, Primus might be my first guess. It really might. <laughs> the vocals certainly give it away, but I mean, Akerfelt's done so many side projects too. I don't know that I would ever guess Opeth either. So yeah, it's just, it's a wild juxtaposition between the two sides. The drums get louder, definitely a rock style here in the B section. Uh, the bass gets louder and more prominent, and tons of groove in it. I love how it doesn't just play the same rhythmic element that our left guitar does. It has its own groovy rhythm that goes along with it. We get this cool polyrhythmic idea. Uh, very cool stuff. The drumming is a bit more metronomic style giving us a steady beat in the background, but it does have a couple polyrhythmic ideas, throwing in some triplets every once in a while, just to change the groove up a little bit. Um, yeah, it's it's just, it's fun. It's catchy. It's groovy. It, it's just a fantastic little section. And I'll tell you what, man, we go from that 
back down into the quiet introspective thing for like eight bars and then build back into the funk. And I, I mean, that made me laugh, right? Um, it's so unexpected. The structure of this makes no sense to me. Why we move between the two the way we do. I mean, I don't know. And the thing is too, is like, we didn't even really need to because it doesn't change anything really. We could have just ended on that funky section and then just had our structure be A, B, songs over. And maybe wrap it up at like three minutes. But instead, they bring back the introspective thing for a few seconds. Go back into the funky side and then wrap it up there. And like, why why did we even need to bring it back down? <laughs> that felt so unnecessary. But for them, they needed to do it. And for me, it, it, there's a comical element to it. I don't know. May, I, maybe that's not intentional. I've laughed at Opeth before. And y'all are like, why are you laughing? I'm like, dude, these guys put punchlines in their music. They, they have consistently written the most dense, wild, atmospherically heavy, emotionally resonant music. And then put a punchline in the middle of all of that. Like... I don't want to say that they're comedy musicians. They're not psycho stick, that's for sure. But they're not always fully serious either. They they firmly have their tongue planted in their cheek in almost every song I've listened to at some point within it. And I love that they just, I don't know, they take their work seriously, but they don't take themselves seriously. And I think that's awesome. Or at least that's the image I get from them. And something like that. Bringing it back down for no reason other than to just bring it right back up 10 seconds later. Seems so <laughs> ridiculous. Ridiculously unnecessary. And yet they went for it anyways. In fact, we listened to a song not too long ago. And the whole ending felt ridiculously unnecessary to me. Um, but it's also what everyone loved about it. I got a chuckle out of it. I thought it was bizarre, but everybody else absolutely loves that ending seriously. So, you know, maybe, maybe I just see things that aren't there. Maybe I'm seeing Opeth for who they want to be seen as. I don't know. Uh, I don't think I have anything else to add to this. Like I said, I thought this was going to be a bit shorter since it's kind of a simple song to talk about. There is some extra depth here, but compositionally just a b a b outro <laughs> so let's dive into some lyrics and see what opeth is singing about on this interesting track all right so there's not a lot of lyrics there's six whole lines in here and they speak about uh, opposing ideas the first says hope would fail me in the falling snow and slake a wish inside Second says, friends would leave me in my darkest hour, yet trust me with their lives. And the final stanza says, she would haunt my dreams and feed my demons. They tell me to go. So losing hope, but gaining a wish. Friends abandoning you, yet still trusting you. They seem contradictory, but it's things that can happen, I suppose. What I find most interesting is that this is a person who has people in their lives who bring negativity to them. They hope for help at one of their lowest moments and instead get nothing. Well, a wish, but still not anything helpful. They're somebody who's at their darkest point. All their friends have left. They need help and they're not getting it. It's a very vague track, but these elements, this emotional concept, uh, I think sits pretty strongly on the outs on the surface of it. So I went and looked up what nepathe is, and it is a possible fictional medicine, possibly fictional medicine for sorrow, mentioned in ancient Greek literatures and mythologies. It uh, kind of translates to the drug of forgetfulness. However, a more literal translation is that which chases away sorrow. So this person is full of sorrow. Friends have left them. There's a, a she who haunts their dreams. Hope is failing them as well. 
they're not in a great place, full of sorrow. And maybe they're wishing that they could find this medicine. In fact, maybe that's what the music is supposed to be. The introspection of wanting help. And then the drug is the funky section that's very bright and uplifting and dancing. You just got to move your body. But like all drugs and medicines, they're only temporary. And so when the song begins to drift back into that introspective section, we immediately take another hit of the drug to get us right back up to the, the feeling that we were before, to remove that sorrow. I don't know, that feels, I mean, it feels right, but is it accurate? I'm curious what the authorial, I'm curious what the authorial intent is on this track. What Opeth wants me to feel from it? what they felt making it and playing it and singing it because they're just there's not a lot of lines to start drawing between what there's not a lot of information here to draw ideas from it's very limited in what it says musically and what it says lyrically and I'm just trying to piece it all together and I, I feel like I have a, a fragmented picture although it's starting to make some sense. However, those are just my thoughts on Opeth's Nepenthe. What about you? Did you enjoy it? Was there anything that stood out to you? Anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on? Maybe just have your own thoughts, opinions, and perspectives about this track. Toss all that stuff down in the comment section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree, which takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for this one. We do have a selection for Pride Month coming up next. Otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. We're going to check out our final track for Jazzy Drumming and our final Pride selection, as this is the end of June. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos.